and it's been uh, you know, crowned for some time and there's a crack. It was crowned initially because of the possible, of the pastoral therapy and the structurally compromised tooth. And now we have a crown that was placed and a considerable amount of money was spent on this tooth. And unfortunately, it's still symptomatic. So the problem we have is, you know, how did this achieve? How can we look at the you know, situation in terms of diagnosis? What were the treatment planning options, both short term and long term? But more or less, not just particular patient, we like to talk about what can possibly go, around, go wrong in this case. So when we go to the next slide, uh, here's a typical question the patient will ask. Doctor, I've been coming every six months and you've taken all these x-rays and all that technology you have, you still cannot pick it up. Maybe you want to comment on this? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, most likely the tooth would have had um, a crack and then the crack propagation occurred over a period of time through function, um, being in function. Um, and obviously what I'm seeing there is a restoration that's very large. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like the occlusal restoration. I can't tell if it's had previous endo or not, but uh, a large restoration itself of that size um, in the wrong area with a slender root anatomy type thing like here uh, is a recipe for disaster uh, eventually, especially in the Bruxa. You see, sometimes there's ever can not come late trauma. They talk about you can put a composite and try to bond those together. The trouble is the composite here has been placed over the amalgam and the amalgam is a wedge. So it just dries the whole tooth and we'll talk later on where single class one restoration or second half spare the rate for root canal teeth. So a risk assessment, assessment is extremely important. Now, when we look at, for instance, risk assessment, and uh, you know, this is a particular patient uh, in the first slide, you can see, for instance, that uh, you know, it's a metal ceramic crown, and I think it's got an excellent fit. I mean, if I blow it up, you can hardly feel the probe, so it's really holding well. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's a healthy patient, it's a bruxer, 73 years of age. And uh, we need to look at risk assessment both at the patient level, the tooth level, and the restoration level. So we need to understand whenever we look at risk assessments, how many levels do we need to assess and come back with a scenario to reduce the risk and as well as uh, improve the prognosis of the tooth. So in this case, unfortunately, patients are severe bruxa. And we'll discuss later in the lecture at what conditions that this really can present quite a risk even though the tooth has been crowned. So when you say to patients, we're gonna crown this tooth to prevent the root fracture happening or we'll stop the fracture happening, you cannot say that in terms of, so we're trying to prophylact prophylactically reduce the risk of the fracture, and this is the best we can do for this moment, but occlusion plays an important key. Um, would you say that from your point of view, uh, maybe? Yeah, um, everything is about the occlusion. Um, I, as a young endodontist, really wasn't taught enough about occlusion, never really got the patient to do excursive movements. Um, but these days I look for things such as interferences and plunger cusps and, and where does the tooth hit? And a, um, one thing I say in all my reports in bold, flat occlusal plane over any endodontically treated tooth um, is what I recommend. Absolutely control the forces. I couldn't agree more with you. And again, uh, what do we see in this particular case? The same tube, so well, we clean it out, the stem blaster, so we can see different areas. And uh, it's, it's very interesting when we look at this tooth, and you can see how the crack line, for instance, propagates here. And this is a well fitting crown, so it's not a dodgy crown, okay? It's a well fitting crown. It's holding this tooth extremely well and it's chamfered. So, in many ways, many ways, you can see the different crack lines that are present. Uh, in this area and uh, how complex uh, the actually crack line is. Uh, uh, what I find uh, most of the time is that, um, most of the time, is that if we understand how the crack propagates, we'll find a way to prevent it. But tooth is any subtropic material, it's very hard to know. It's very hard to know which way the crack propagates, although we have many diagnostic tools a lot of these diagnostic tools from a prophylactic point of view is basically what's over less so visual and special, fluorescence, fiber optic, digital, digital, you know, radiographs and imaging. 
and the conduit city actually draws a digital data graph, but it's separate on its own. You can dodge and a frac find, which we are there, microscopes, and can be a CT. So a lot of the problems we see is actually sort of gingival, but if you get very hard there, you can tell what happens in the subgingival uh, part of the tooth. Um, uh, so more or less, uh, are you seeing my main slide, the big slide at the moment? Yes. All right. yes. The yes. main slide, okay. And uh, what I thought, and this is universally accepted protocol, is that it is generally agreed that able restorative therapy is to immobilize the segments of the tooth that more loading. So we are trying to maintain the integrity of the tooth. And in many ways, we'll come to it later on, the more we try to crown the teeth, we can in many ways maybe weaken the tooth as well. Uh, and we need to think about this paradox because uh, we're trying to do in many ways, we can weaken the tooth. So uh, it will, you know, that will lead to the next few questions we'll come back later on. So we know that immediate uh, therapy for the cracked tooth you know, syndrome is basically uh, you know, the quicker you act, the quicker you produce symptoms that occur. And the quicker your app is, is based on your diagnosis, your recall visits, and that allows you to assess your patients early on and diagnose areas that are likely to have this problem. Uh, when we send the patient in on the donors, sometimes maybe it's too late, isn't it? Because you know, yeah, it's... prevent this. Is that correct? Definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes. Um... Patients have had symptoms for a long time and they start with cold air sensitivity and uh, chewing a certain way sensitivity. By the time they end up with, uh, I don't know, cellulitis or a full on swelling, um, probably the crack is propagated and it's a bit too, 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 too late to brace or save some of them. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And uh, this is the problem we have. Well, when we think about treatment options, when you look at treatment options, I know this slides are a bit small, but it's trying to make sense. Immediate treatment options, like basically what I do, with, I try to do a closure refinement of the weakened tooth structure, uh, even before you try to, uh, you know, complete the work, before even referring to you for any treatment. I want to reduce the risks of anything happening by the time the patient gets to see you. Okay, so I will probably place a, you know, orthodontic band I think every dentistry that is also in band. I mean, copper bands are still around, but I have to get, but also in bands are very readily available. It's a bit, it's, people say it's time consuming. I said this in the report, but I don't think so. It takes, you know, this is a, you know, less than 10 minutes you can put these bands on. I don't like the idea of temporary crown. So if you do a temporary crown and the patient doesn't hurt diagnosis, temporary crown can flex. I'm not happy with that. I want to have an orthotic band on a tooth, okay? Run a temporary crown, maybe. Okay, even though some temporary crowns can be, but this is flexion. So you're making it worse. You're actually weakening a tooth. You're trying to place uh, something that's flexible on the tooth. Let's think about this. And then you're trying to wait for another week or so by the time you have the patient back. And you know, if you have a big long turnaround time, and by the time the patient comes back to you, they may be symptomatic, and that's the end of the treatment. So the whole money that's wasted. Uh, so I I like to think, you know, people say direct composite splint. I'm not happy with this. That was a result of it, not just one case per se. You know, we say, oh, well, there's 20% chance of it happening. Then you don't know 20% or there's a, you know, there's out of the hundred, only one patient has this problem. The trouble is for that patient, it's a hundred percent failure. We don't realize that sometimes, you know, we can't just look at a whole patient base. Every patient is a prototype, every patient is individual. So for that patient, it's a hundred percent failure. For this patient, thought we can do with a composite on the right, it's a hundred percent failure. And the problem is we need to think ahead. And liver empathy goes a long way with patients with crack tooth syndrome. Because they've been not just to you first, they've been to other people. And finally, so look, you know, this is the problem. So bond and partial ceramics, well, they're fine. Like so, for instance, it's good. I don't mind having a nice uh, you know, uh, sort of onlay type to actually bond, but the trouble is they don't provide that tooth rigidity. They want to restore, regain, as well as we'll do such as uh, metal adhesive onlays or uh, full wall crowns or uh, metal ceramic crowns, okay? Uh, so in many ways, high-free gold is excellent for a lot of the teeth that 
that are severely worn and about to fracture, so you can actually do that. Even symptomatic tip, I place a lot of them in the posterior areas. This is only the third and the second molars you can see. And I thought it's a bit of a there's a bit of a perforation of the only, but doesn't matter. Patient still asymptomatic, they function well because it wears like a natural tooth. And you've got full crowns, we'll come back to the full crown. And I, and, I, and we'll talk about zirconia, I put it in red here, so that we'll talk about this later with time. And this is on the right, this is a zirconia crown. Well, we're coming back to our favorite topic, uh, Medi, in the, you know, about 20% of all teeth diagnosed with Krakow syndrome will eventually require endodontic treatment. Now that 20% after it's been treated, it's actually, you know, uh, the prognosis is quite poor. So the failure rate of, uh, is a 15% of cracked teeth, a root field after two years is quite a concern, isn't it? When we try and restore these teeth. So we need to tell our patients, although we did root therapy to this highly compromised, and sometimes even doing a crown, you might end up losing a tooth. They should know about this. Okay, so that's the important part of the consent process, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So that brings me to the next question. Okay, next statement. The risk assessment, I mean, here's the patient, you can see, all right, and you know, there's another crack, we'll come back to that later on. But the question I will have next one is that really the risk assessment is empirical, isn't it? If you really believe in something, you better go to church and pray and think that things will be better. Uh, I like that slide. I, I thought that, you know, most of the risk assessment behavior is empirical. It's based on knowledge, experience, and feasibility, isn't it? When you think about it, you gain knowledge through experience, you get feasibility for knowledge plus experience because that you have an idea where this can be later on and you try to walk back. We'll talk about later on. So when we look at it, the reason of crown fracture, expectations, patient compliance, crown to rug ratio, view of ethical core feral, root therapy, and the endodontic status, the bone support, aesthetic, smile line, bite type, occlusion, occlusion dynamic, okay, it's not static. People talk about static. Well, like, oh, show me your bike. No, it's dynamic. It's most of the time during this dynamic that you have all your interferences happening that loads the tooth. And we'll talk about later on root canal teeth have what? They have castle flexure as beam mechanics. And that's when things fire. So clinical experience and patient history helps immensely. Okay, immensely. We need to listen to our patients. Listen to our patients. Okay, irrespective of whatever. We need to preserve as much tooth as possible, as much as possible to restore teeth. So, prognosis affected tooth, okay, by three principal factors. Uh, we talked about this uh, extent and location of the fracture. The point in time when restorative intervention is initiated, the quicker, the better. You need to get specialists on board. When a patient like this, I'm doing major consulting work. You get a letter from your medic. Medic, would you mind looking at this patient following teeth? I need to do a long-term prognosis. Uh, you kindly advise me, say, so I think. I'm not quite sure about this tooth. I'm not quite sure, sure about this tooth, but this is what I think at the end of the day. And this is important for me as a part of the treatment plan to get the you know, restorative uh, program on board and make the patient understand that they actually own the risk. As much as I will try to help them, there's a risk that patient needs to understand. And naturally, doctor restoration is important, as we discussed earlier. So really, when you think about, you know, cracked tooth syndrome is like a stress tooth. This tooth is stress. We're looking at stress tooth situation. Imagine if you have a laminate, a kitchen laminate, you try to break that laminate. It never breaks in one line, isn't it? So it breaks in different lines, okay? Different, you are all the different chips everywhere, little sharp ends. You can never put it together the same way. Teeth are similar, it's anisotropic. So prophylactic measures risk assessment for this patient. Now here's a patient presents in my practice, okay? And uh, you think about this, she, you know, she wants to have aesthetic improvement, I'll come to this picture later on, but what I like to ask this, for instance, I like to know how does she lose those teeth? She wants implants. I don't know. Oh, yes, you need implants there. I thought that is not the first question that we should be asking to the patient. Okay? There's other factors involved, such as period, she's a smoker. I'll come to this image later on. But I want to know, okay, the history of a tooth fracture. And patient will tell you, well, I was eating something crumbling in my mouth here. They removed it and crumbled this one here. There's a reason for that. 
it was a highly restored tulip. It's always the sixes. At that age group, okay, she's in her mid fifties, they usually lost the sixes, it was heavily filled, but they don't just crumble for that reason. There's a reason why it happens. And the history of the tooth needs to be very specific. So we need to actually listen to our patient. Patients in the way what they tell us to help us in our diagnosis. Well, here's a patient that initially presented. We replaced the copper band. All right, this is bonded. I mean, you can use GIC. I use GIC chlorophyll, and that's an asymptomatic from symptomatic. She was fine, could function, reduce the cast slightly to give me all the chance to reduce further trauma to the tube, reduce further stress on the tube. And we did the preparation finally because patients didn't like the aesthetics of the metal band. I would have preferred the gold crown, the metal ceramic with a metal overlay. That was out of the question. But basically, when you really dry this tooth, it's quite obvious that you can see different crack lines. That's not the group. There's another crack line here. There's so many other crack lines here that is impossible to tell. You're only looking at one view. Like prior images, you can see that cracks are different angles. We don't know how they, you may see one part of the crack at one time. It's a free, full three dimensional um, area that one needs to look at. Well, when you look at objective diagnostic tool, I know whether you might think you might make a crack worse, but sometimes we need to really uh, start on this patient. And uh, as you can oh, see, sorry, I'm going to do the test because I want to take a look. So you're looking at distant buckle cusp. Have you got this? Oh, four six. Yeah, it's a four six. So I think I think so. So he's got a very stiff cusp. He's got hardly any restorations, right? There's no pain. There's no pain on the buckle. Okay. There's no pain. This is distal legal cusp. That's a distal legal. That's pain. That's a fractured cusp. But have a look when the pain occurs. Now, this is the distal lingual cusp of the fracture child. Sorry, but I really want you to stop it. Just go to my, <laughs> my students. Press. Now, wait. <laughs> Open. So, <laughs> pain. <laughs> Terribly sorry about this. The pain actually was when I, when we opened this mouth and stress was released. So, that's probably question why you might have to answer later on. I might give you extra one CPD point if you tell me that why was the pain worse when we released the pressure. So, cast of risks. Maybe what's your, what's your, what's your um, experience in this? What do you think? I mean, does it make sense here? I mean, we, we saw this tooth here, lower right. I mean, there's more. High, high risk of the uh, lingual cusps, um, lower molars, um, upper buccal cusps, um, of premolars, they're the main risk areas. Correct. Yeah, I noticed here the, on the, on the, on the, on the maxilla, the premolar and the buccal cusps are very high and hardly anything here. It's very interesting to see. Uh, now, different, uh, different um, sort of papers give you different records, but I think this would be well spot on. And you can see some of these cases that actually corresponds to this diagram. I think it's a very good diagram that gives a condition why. One of the reasons that premolars tend to fracture in, we'll come back to it later on, there's a two reasons for that. But, uh, Understand that all the balancing and uh, all the skills of the next metaphysical, lateral movements, you need to adjust them uh, where you think patients load in the clenching. We're seeing lower fracture teeth at the moment. Obviously, COVID has something to do with it, my belief. But for we, what we did for that patient boy was I, when they reduced the medial trusive interference, I was flexing that cusp, okay? So that the uh, I use a coarse diamond because I don't want to hit that tooth. Yeah. And if it, it's very sensitive to cold, so no, I just gently adjust it, adjust the, uh, adjust it, adjust it, adjust it, reduce it. Right. So, right. Open. That's why you come more comfortable? Mm. Yes, yeah. it's comfortable. So yeah. patient's happy. Okay. So, but we did, did later on crown that tooth, So what happens in primary occlusal trauma, we're checking for primitives. Uh, this is a normal part of recap process. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's important to understand when you have this situation, for instance, what you're trying to do is that right. regularly patient bites, yeah. and this is a point in crowns, which I placed Open. a few, few years ago. This Open. is an right. old video. This is about right. 10 years right. in function. 
but at the time it was about I think four years. I can feel that movement. Yeah. So we can see the movements. I'm feeling the tick as I go. Okay. And what I'm really doing, especially to pair on stability, I'm reducing a root fracture here. And I'm sure many would be very happy with this concept, right? You're trying to reduce the root fracture. And I can feel the teeth. She's wearing, it's becoming a sacrificial large, unfortunately, because of the zirconia. But I would rather reduce the zirconia than reduce the lower teeth, as you can see later on. So we'll adjust them. You can see the super contacts in this area as we talk. Coming back to the next stage, this is for the issue when we place the full zirconia restoration some time ago. This is almost 10 years, this case from, from now, not during the case taken. So you know, we have very nice work. It all looks good. It looks fine and looks great. But when you think about on the regular maintenance, after four years, patients start developing fremitus on the centrals. And the powder of the was to go regularly, we adjust them. Uh, you can use a high speed, up to four feet, not to use a high speed, you can. Use a, uh, some of those uh, silicone wheels with a straight handpiece and just go and adjust them. And that's a very good way of doing it. You, you ask the patient to bite, and while well, your fingers on the level of the tooth, and ask the patient to pull, and that they you know those contacts. Okay, some people prefer these electronic devices, and they tell this way by it, that's fine. I need to think. And Sarkis, did you realize the lower and lower anteriors uh, would wear further with this type of Absolutely. hard restoration, or did you see that over time? I've seen this all the time, and I've stopped doing zirconia restorations. Um, and uh, 90, 90, what, 95% of the time, now my technician, Harry, is here present at the moment, and he knows how the practice has changed. So last uh, six years, I was basically uh, using a metal ceramic. You can see later on on other patients. It's purely gold backing, and I get just as good aesthetics, and that's probably a very, very good fit of the crown that will surpass any kind of zirconia restorations. And again, uh, you do get create physiologic occlusion in this particular area. You need to adjust, refine very carefully. You know, I have a higher, uh, so uh, a higher age group practice where premise is common, not just from the occlusion point of view and the restoration and that for root function point, of view, but also from periodontal point of view. And uh, we'll have that later. And you can see, for instance, here, what we're doing is uh, typically we are, you can see I'm pushing it by, I'm pulling that through. Okay, and I will adjust, and each time I see applying, adjusting, and I will go back. This is ceramic restorations, the Emax restorations. So I'll be adjusting Emax. Actually, do we do like uh, do like using Emax restorations because uh, actually I prefer them much better as a corneum. Whenever I have enamel, I would use Emax in all cases. Having said that, in this case, for instance, we have a structure compromised number two, two, that's a root fill premolar, because the patient um, at the moment did not want implant placement, and I'm happy to restore that tooth. We can understand that, for instance, here's a, here's a yeah, see, I can feel that. And when you have a six month recall for patients, you have to explain them that, don't just do a checkup and a clean, you have to actually check the occlusion. It's very important, it's a metal ceramic, with post and core and a very weak tooth. And, uh, on the right here, you can see that what I'm doing is and I'm adjusting the, the gold ceramic, and that's very gold backing. You can't really see any of the difference between Emax and gold ceramic. And uh, people ask me where you get your gold ceramic, etc. And, and the real gold, I use the Arbor Club products in here most of the time, and that gives me a very nice predictability. So it is important to adjust and assess enough. And, and if you look very carefully here, which is not playing, unfortunately, but uh, exclusive movements, it, it cannot, uh, it, exclusive movements, you'd be clearing the lateral incisor, there will be no lateral incisor. And you can see that here, it's about contacts that needs to be adjusted each and every time and during, uh, unfortunately, it is not playing here. Okay, go to the next slide. So when we look at vertical fracture diagnosis, your carbon CT will help you. I mean, you can see the swelling here on the, on the, on the lower slide, okay? And uh, you can see the crack, you can actually gently move this crack, you can gently move it. But most importantly, if you want to look at a, on the cone beam CT, this is quite obvious. And many will talk about the ones that are not obvious in the later on in this, in this lecture. 
but more or less, you can see the crack here that's running along here. All right. So uh, having co-university is a great help. And uh, if you don't have one, you can do naturally directly, but uh, you know, we'd like to have this concept where you can see the fracture here. And again, we have a whole fracture of the tooth with, uh, maybe you want to comment here at this stage? Um, no, no, I think that's a straightforward one. Okay. Okay, yeah. let's move on then. Uh, yeah. Is there any questions um, or does anyone you know, have any questions? Uh, just about halfway. Please write to me and uh, I'll be able to answer a lot of the questions. Uh, and uh, there's a chat area, so please talk to me. I'm happy to listen and answer your questions later on. Uh, once uh, we finish the lecture, I'll be able to help you with that. But do write the questions you have. I'll come back and discuss the slides with you. Okay. All right. Now, fail tooth, one, one. Okay. And people say it's micro leakage or whatever. Okay, it's leakage. Uh, and uh, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. yeah. Because this tip is like a micro leakage. Uh, so this is file to be resumed a few times. And we know when it's resumed a few times, the definite fracture on the root system. There's no question. And the trouble is that when, when I get referred this and I'll I have excellent uh, dentists who and colleagues who are for me, patients for implant placement. And we look at it over here, you can see the reason why that tooth fracture. And, and the problem is that uh, if you look very, very carefully, the position of the teeth, the angle of the teeth, I mean, the same forces are going to be placed on the implant, which will cause implant compoundary failure, prosthetic screw fracture, button screw fracture, and implant fracture. Uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes implants fracture the bone. I had one case which happened, patient actually broke the whole implant, it was integrated, the whole thing came up in mass. So it's very important to think about how do we need to ask the important question of this unfavorable occlusal context. So a failure has occurred because the patient is a very heavy dentition, it's got reduced, you know, it's very deep bite, reduced into arch height, and it's got a very high mastic energy forces. He knows how it's true. The history of fractured teeth. You ask him, there's a lot of history of fractured teeth. So it makes you think twice about just placing a single implant here. We are improving the prognosis of the entire dentition. So don't just look at a tooth, look at the whole thing, the whole patient. And, uh, and there's that parafunction, cracks, fractures. So there's a lot of problems here. Okay, a lot of problems here. It's an unfavorable occlusional context. And when we start thinking about multiple fractures, etc., you need to change your occlusional prescription. You have to create new prescription. Whatever materials you have, in this case, we build the whole anterior gardens and open the body with composites. Later on, we restore the whole mouth with uh, you know, a new implant support and tooth support uh, fixed prosthesis. But the issue was I was not going to allow my implant be under hammering forces of the lower arch. That was gonna be, you know, not part of the trip. So he agreed with the patient that the implant would be only placed and the crown restored only if you could control the occlusion. Because that prevents crack propagation. Okay. So today people are keeping their teeth longer and teeth to have fatigue with a good strong fluoride and strength of that. So the more forces, more chance, especially with deep cusps with strong mesh plunging cast situation that uh, Mehdi was talking about, that we actually split those roots. So, you know, the earlier you are, the more chance you're gonna have a cracked teeth. Now, 96.1% of cracked teeth are responding to bypass. That's very good, higher specificity, okay, for that area and sensitivity. 81% of cracked teeth observed in medial distal direction. Now, again, no respirations, but they're looking at 154 cases of teeth, uh, right and knee. And 60% uh, had no restorations, 20%, 29% had restoration. That's 90% of the teeth, okay? It's only small restorations. After the age of 40, 31%. And as you get older, you know, it reduced by prevalence similarly in men and women. So in the men have higher forces, women, but about the same. statistically, there's no lot of difference, okay? They said magazine walls had higher, you know, uh, fractures and crack teeth than, than mandible walls. I'm not quite sure, but maybe that's in that particular sense. But the main thing is that the crack happens in teeth that are under restored. So the patient comes to you, it's got symptomatic tooth, 
there's no registration, that would be my first reason to think. Would you agree on that, mate? Yeah, non-vital, unrestored um, teeth, uh, recipe for disaster. The most common area they're found is the lower second molar region. Certainly. Yeah, there's, there's some literature on that as well. That's what I'm saying. So I remember looking at all this wood fracture, and uh, we talked about this. Uh, and uh, when we look at the, the other people that turf there, for instance, we know that there's no scientific reason to explain which direction is going to go. Now, in this big place, I can tell you there's a number of issues here. There was a lack of ferro, but the forces acting on the palatal part of the core. There's hardly any palatal area to actually hold the anterior forces. You can see a uh, number of times uh, this has been adjusted and uh, all the areas of the lower tooth compact. So unfortunately, the dentist has failed to prophylactically reduce this tooth to reduce this tearing, uh, you know, dissecting sort of a palatal part of the central incisor fracture. You can see the post there. So be very when you put post because unless it's done properly, et cetera, occlusion is controlled, you ask asking for the catastrophe and uh, you know, you may have adequate feral design for at least two millimeters. Looking at parafunction and apnea, uh, we talked about uh, the way we understand dental hardness is very important. Forces, the habits, migration mobility of tear fracture cast, so you've got muscle pain, et cetera, got the joint overloading, but maybe you want to talk about a bit more about apnea. Uh, yeah. So, um, we, we do uh, intravenous sedation a lot and part of intravenous sedation, of course, um, patients that are severe gag reflex or sensitive, you know, gag. And often those patients have um, large tongue and quite, uh, some of them might end up having quite a large neck region. So a lot of those patients, when they end up uh, sleeping, I notice things that I normally didn't pay attention to. For example, um, at various stages of their sleep, uh, the REM sleep or, 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 or even deeper sleep, um, they can actually have this muscle spasm. This masseter muscle, obviously the strongest muscle in the body is the masseter muscle. <laughs> um, they end up spasming as I'm, I've got their mouth wide open um, treating with a rubber dam and uh, sometimes you see them while they're sleeping going into an apnea and while they're going into apnea again they get this jerk action and that's what they're doing when they're actually sleeping patients that have respiratory issues uh, overweight patients large neck size and you know we talk about the malapathy score um, not being able to see the back of the um, the uvula um, score three or four these ones are the ones that i actually check and when they go to sleep and they wake up i ask them to have a sleep apnea test um, i tell them to go and see a respiratory physician many of these patients where they're lying down what they're doing is they're bringing the lower jaw forward and they're doing really strange excursive movements which results in cracks it results in catastrophic um, tooth fractures because what they're trying to do is they're trying to create more room for the throat and breathe, gasp for air. So, and, and the muscle really, really spasms. That's what I've noticed. And so watch out for such patients. So if you do see an overweight patient, brachyfacial, quite round face, you know, large neck size, and they say they have restless sleep, you've got to relate that because now the, there is a definite relationship between those patients and cracked teeth and bruxism. Yeah. 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 It's very common. And a lot of them have also TMJ, TMD issues as well. Like you palpate the muscles of mastication, you um, get them to open and close and you see crepitus in the joint and you take a, um, you know, a scan of their jaw and you realize that they've had degeneration. Um, some of them are unilateral. So one side's worse than the other. Um, again, always think about these things. Don't forget how their sleep pattern um, may be as a result of apnea they might be doing a lot of damage interesting how different patients got different uh, adaptive you know um, uh, how they adapt to different uh, scenarios for instance a patient with brush they have a tmd if they happen to have tmd and uh, when you 
asked me, have any pain? And Joe Master said, no, but when he actually start palpating, the pain is there. So he pressed really hard, it's like eight out, the best was eight out of 10. Then you, you know, we do a special test, we do a, a, a special TMD, um, in a DC TMD test, which is an international um, scoring system for patients who diagnose TMD. So access one, access two, and uh, access one more physiologic, access more uh, biopsychosocial area where you look at the patient other areas. So a lot of these patients have got uh, other confounding issues when it comes to the stress. And so, you know, when you have stressful situations and you too have to look at both ends of it. So sometimes the sleep apnea uh, is one part of the equation and there's the other issue the psychological issues and if you sometimes get psychosis on board for stress management etc and a lot of people tell you i'm not stressed i'm okay i'm fine i know what i'm doing but you know what they're doing when you ask them to press they really press hard and i'll show some videos in a second let's go back to this patient here uh patient presents and uh, you know uh, com and her main complaint is like in you know, my I look older than I am, and she's a she's a good friend, a family, and she's give me permission to show her pictures. And the uh, trouble is that we can fall in a trap of aesthetics and say, yep, we can display your smile, whatever, but uh, you'll be asking for a lot of trouble, and I'll go through this in detail. This is a common thing that I get complaints coming into the surgery uh, by colleagues uh, who are really good dentists and they like to do beautiful restorations, and and sometimes. They can't see the other side, the other compounding issues, such as the loading of the systems, the motor system. You're looking at, you know, the, the motor generator, and it's far more difficult for this patient to control. And let's just look at this in detail. This was the early slide which I presented, uh, you know, initially. Now, the problem is that when we look at this patient, you've got a smoke, there's a moderate. Um, and to an angular bolus where it appears on the seeds. You can see them on the arrow, especially on posterior areas. Uh, you can see the large angular defect. Now, smoker, angular defect, and a clencher, an anterior bruxa. Now, they're all that a trifecta for bolus and root and tooth fraction and root fracture. So that's really concerns most of the time. And then look very, very carefully. I mean, to control the risk factors. So before we do anything with this patient, I need to control the risk factors. But the patient says, no, my gums are fine. And I, uh, just, just fix my teeth, make it look good. No, the answer is I will not compound on the existing clinical situation. That's the brought the patient to this level. So improve oral hygiene, stop smoking. Dennis, forget to ask the patients to stop smoking. That's the important public health measure. Okay, we need to achieve periodontal stability. So, you know, I've involved uh, my periodontist, uh, uh, S.M. Malati and the stem boiatis to get this under control with my hygienist as well. And we only have them be able to control the occlusion. Okay, and we'll talk about restoring the occlusion. Look at, looking at, we need to organize, reorganize, or consider the existing occlusional context, which just means conformity. And then we need to ask the patient before we start. The maintenance protocol. If you don't feel you're going to come in every four to six months, they your teeth clean and maintain. Perhaps you better see another guy. So that's how we talk. Okay, because if you can't control the situation, you're not responsible for it. But what I'm really worried here, what I'm really worried in this situation, is you can see the error. Okay, there's a problem here. There's a crown here. Okay, and the patient's loading, and that concerns me. So when you start doing any treatments for this patient, you're going to bring out the problem. There's a propensity amongst colleagues to say, I'm going to not tell you this problem, that problem, because you know what? They won't have, they won't have a treatment done. The answer is no. Patient needs to understand what the situation is. You should be explaining them in the simplest format so that they can understand. I'm in this room here. I have a huge screen. And now so the patient comes right next to me. We look at the whole thing together. And this is what I'm teaching colleagues to all the students. Okay, we learn to diagnose, we learn to assess, we learn to take good images, good x-rays, all the first things first. And that's important, you build up your case, but you present the patient what they really, what's a normative need, you can build on the next one. It's very important. It's very important not to sell them because you are doctors, you are not salesmen. You don't have to go to a selling course to understand how to present dentistry. You are a doctor, so behave a doctor and present your case to the patient for their well-normative being.
please understand that's a very important part where we actually teach in my college in our college where uh, maybe it's also a faculty member and we discuss it so what we need to do about this to a patient narrows and what we do we also ask the question how do we lose those teeth so there's normal risk factors I need to assess before I take the patient on. Well, look at the occlusion, for instance, on the dynamic occlusion. She has lost the incisors of the anterior guidance, and most of the occluding teeth and guiding teeth are posterior teeth. Now, again, if a patient's clenching and brushing, if you're loading posterior teeth, the periodontium, okay, of the anterior teeth has got different sensibility. You know, so if you want to feel hard, how hard the egg shell is, you pick up the egg and you use your bottom front teeth, low incisors, and you go tap, 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 because you have the highest feeling there. So upper two central incisors, upper and lower, give you the highest sensibility, okay? They are more sensitive to lateral movements, okay? Okay, than vertical. While the molars are more sensitive to, ver to, to vertical movements, and less sense to lateral movement. So if you take a lot of load, they're going to keep loading, and that's how fractures occur. Okay, this was a very famous study in the in the early nineties and uh, mid two thousand two thousand four. Now let's look at further. Let's get further in this particular case. We're going to the left hand to the left. This is the left hand side. This is the molded guiding. Okay, this is destructive. Okay, perhaps you can ask maybe how did this two post loss was heavily restored? Okay, it's a complex occlusion. So, again, part of the maintenance protocol has to be patient must wear an occlusional splint. But the occlusional splint is not a panacea because the occlusion has been prescribed correctly. So, patients may be non compliant. So, your prescription of occlusion should be that if the patient doesn't wear the occlusional splint, Will the dentition of our whole stomatognathic system manage? That's important. Okay, that's extremely important for you to understand. And we're going looking at different angles. The guidance is on the 4 7. Okay, is okay. And on the, going the other side, guidance is on, on the left side. So this is destructive. Patients are Yes, it's a traumatic occlusion. So we need to restore this. So peri control. Stop smoking, pair control, cares control. You got a problem tooth, that one. So I'm going to make sure that whatever I do, that this tooth, tooth number two four, is not loaded. That should be in your treatment plan. So when I go and do the treatment plan for this patient, it will take two hours of my time to write the treatment plan. Then I'll stick to the healing, and patient knows and consents to this treatment plan. It intrigues them when dentists have from the different implant institutions, they have a consent form. Maybe, you know what I'm talking about. Just consent. And I'm looking at a consent form to give a medical legal opinion. That consent form is not worth the piece of paper written because it is not specific to that patient. Okay? When you write this to your patient, it has to be specific to that patient for that particular scenario. Okay? And they have to understand. So having said that, what we did for this patient, restore the in size of guidance, I mean, we, and we did all the prerequisite work, the oral hygiene improvements, stop smoking. Uh, you know, she's still continuous, but we've told her we can only try. But uh, oral hygiene improves, she comes every four months. Uh, this is about 10 years ago, so we went from here and we restored the, you know, in size of guidance, the reverse smile lab was restored. I'm not going to talk about aesthetics, but this is simple, composite, direct restoration. It took about three hours to do. We bonded to the existing model because it will wear out a lot better not to reduce this. So, and now this patient is a happy patient. Now, simple restoration, this is a composite restoration. We did, and we teach all this in the college as well. But the most important is that, you know, you probably think this is a bonded, some sort of ceramic restoration. The answer is no. They are simple, composite, direct bonded restorations. And we lengthened those teeth by almost about six millimeters. Okay, no issue. I don't care, no support. So, you know, control forces and improve aesthetics. Simple, non-invasive treatment. This was 2007. Let's look at further on. This is your favorite area, medic, can't be a for diagnosis. And you can see over here, okay, you can see over here, there's a crack line. A crack line is that way. Those of you who can't be in CT, in that crack line, so it goes in this position. I think it just goes straight in there so you can see it. 
that's the same turf and you can see the crack line coming along here. I hope it's visible on the screen there. It's a very fine line. So uh, that's simpler to explain to the patient. Here's the same patient. Patient in a, lost the canine guidance. guidance. So basically, uh, anteriorly is on the right. So he hasn't lost the canine guidance on the left. It's all clear on the right. is touching on the primal. There is no rest stations on that. So with time, uh, he's, you know, he's grinding in stress and uh, always look for a cause. You've got to look for a cause. That's very important. And I'm just going to show the video. Patient goes forward. It's cleared and it's going to the right soon. Move to the right. And pressing hard. Okay. You can see the swelling here from the root fracture. That's that's symptomatic. Okay. It's just a buckle cast of fractures on the upper premolar. This is classical examples of it. Okay. Okay. We still have your canine guide. Go to the left bit more. More, 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 yeah. that, that clears off, okay? That gives you an oh, idea yeah. of what I'm talking about, yeah. okay? okay? So, Good. more importantly, yeah. more yeah. importantly, coming back. And that patient, you know, we have the same problem here. Uh, you have a one four. you have a typical J-curve, you have a J-curve, you got a chilia, yeah? is that right? Okay. Yeah, well, J-shaped lesion on a, on, I guess on a chromium CT, you can see more subtle ones called the chimney defects. It's like really subtle bone loss. You'll, you'll get one soon. There'll be a case of... But what I would say immediately is, is looking at that particular turf, I go back and I say, why did we lose this turf? And we got an implant. How did we also have an implant? So I'll be looking at a lot of things, not just looking at that turf. I'll get the whole map. I want to see the risk factors. I think profiling patients are very important. Again, uh, they have to look at the area of extended lesion here. Okay? Patient won't have an immediate implant. So no way. Can't do it. Take it out, clean it, Graft it and go back. Rarely I'll be surprised if I find bond in there. So that's interesting. Well, maybe tell me something about this. I mean, don't you think it's a classical kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's a classic uh, vertical root fracture. You can see the bone loss and you can even see the line when you adjust the CBCT. So you can see there's been a bit of bone loss in the mid buckle region and just so sort of the crack you can see travels down the root. Um, classic, classic example of a, obviously a vertical root fracture. You, you know, interesting thing is that when I look at a CT scan, I spend like a long time with each patient. Now I've had good colleagues, my special facial surgeons that spend time together and also in London and here. And, uh, and now we go through every section slowly, 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 slowly. There's no way I would pick this up if I didn't go slowly, slowly and just get that defect because it's so obvious. Uh, this so, yeah, I mean, the, the one thing is to take the scan. The other thing is to have a good quality scan, have um, smaller slices, like 0.1 millimeter slices. And the other thing is to know how to read the scan properly um, is, is, a, is a skill. So you just can't take a full scan. You've got to do a small focal field scan or... Yeah, you've got to reduce your slices. You're not doing a dental implant. Um, you're actually looking at more subtle signs. Exactly. The patient had all reconstructive work done um, and um, came from a period that she had symptoms that was all discovered. Uh, anyway, we, we're trying to have the situation here. Now, we're coming to our favorite topic soon. This is a lovely patient. The case was restored by uh, the very prominent process, one of my great mentors, and I respect him so highly. You can see how he gradually, slowly adjusts, 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 adjusts in occlusion, and you can see the post. Okay, this is a one, two, this is the post here, okay, protruding the crown, okay, this is the post, protruding the crown, okay, on, on two, one, and uh, that's a gold post, okay, and, and that, that doesn't matter. It's perforation, so what? It's been perforated for like 10, 15 years. This can be around for more than 20, more than 25 years. Okay. So here's the beauty of the treatment is that the, you will adjust the manage the occlusion because to create physiologic occlusion, to maintain physiologic occlusion. So it's the most, I would say, after 25 years with a you know with a skiing fracture, now she presented with uh, symptoms of uh, labial, you know, sinus on and off, on and off, has had few opinions. And you can see uh, in a week time, we'll talk about why this has happened. We'll discuss it in a minute. But uh, uh, Mehdi, your stage, go ahead. Yeah, so essentially when I saw this patient, um, she was really keen to 
shave any of her teeth. She didn't really want to lose any tooth. But um, what you're seeing there on, I think it's the one two, is it, uh, Sarkis? One one, one one. Yeah, yeah, one one. So, um, what you're seeing there is um, that arrow on the top right is a classic example of a chimney defect. And when you look at it from the side on, it's bone loss that laterally travels up the root that you, if sometimes it's really hard to see actually with a 2D film. But when you see this lateral bone loss or really, really widened ligament just between the bone and the, and the root, um, this is a classic example of a vertical root fracture in heavily restored teeth like this tooth here. Interesting what you say. Uh, another colleague, Peridotus, wanted to explore the surgery to have a look if it's a root fracture or not. And I said, nonsense. With a high yeah. smile line, with a high smile line, I'm just going to come back with a high smile line, okay? Uh, I can't afford, I can't afford explore through surgery to a certain a root fracture. It's just yeah, a so, so it was another endodontist prior to me and I said, I, I, I just said, look, it's the comb beam is so clear cut, um, no point in cutting and then ending up with a scar, it's, especially if you, I didn't want to um, damage your, you know, smile line and what you're about to do next. I need that bone. I need this bone. Yeah. I need this bone, okay? And uh, I need this bone to maintain the, you know, the, your gum integrity and symmetry, although it's asymmetric here, but Whatever I can, I still have a safety zone to play with the gums. That's later on in reconstructive work. But one of the reasons that um, this file is the fact that it's a fantastic work. It's one of the best work I've seen. I've seen the history of this patient when uh, you know uh, my mentor was still going through, and uh, and uh, it's very interesting that with time, the crowding, you're seeing the low incisors, and what happened was she didn't. Unfortunately, for some reason, didn't go back to my mentor and been looking after the local dentist. They had no idea what was going on. So for, for another five years, the occlusion was already fine. Okay? And that was like, I would say, supervised neglect because it was probably beyond the ability of the colleague. But sometimes these complex cases require really special management. And it's very important to say, look, uh, let me get someone else on board. We work together. And that is all the time. So refinement, adjustment, I mean, you know, you don't have to remove all this, but this will take, we'll go for a few more years. And that shows the fatigue here, fatigue of the root system. You know, anything is possible, she will be something hard. We don't know, but I know she's a very careful lady. The lady is on television personality, so you got to do all the processes. So I'd like to ask the question, if anyone, if you remember this slide, how would you treat this patient, given that, you know, you've got all these problems? So any, any opinion will be taken. Uh, there's no one. So what happens when you have bruxes? I'm here, this referred patient. Bridge work, okay, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, if we did sacrificial arch, we got the wrong one. So it was half class at all, okay? So every case is unique. I mean, we have a major issue here. It's far more complicated, this problem, you see. It's complicated because roots are failing and uh, it's got a high spine, I'll show later on. And, and uh, how do we restore this patient between the treatment and implant therapy while well, implants are integrated? I mean, I need to think about this. He won't wear a denture. Bruxes don't like dentures. They will smash it, especially if they've had one. You know, he's a 45-year-old man. Okay, we need to think about all in between. So, uh, so it's, it's just complex. It's complex. And uh, I mean, look at the situation. All right. And uh, we, we did the implants and, uh, you know, this is not zirconia. I just wouldn't do zirconia and I'll tell you why in a minute. But this is before... We improved the oral hygiene and you know, I was back on the maintenance program and the whole smile line, we grafted a lot of bone grafts and healing, etc. And we finally got here. But let's look at the x-rays because the maintenance protocol wasn't here by the time we issued the actual maxillary fixed implant support bridge work. And uh, this is before when the patient started. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, uh, the, the problem we have here is multiple, uh, we have uh, fractured roots and uh, some teeth need to be removed to allow me to place implants, but how do we maintain the uh, long-term provisional restoration during that process while the implant therapy is being uh, issued. We did restore this patient, we did restore them, 
Okay. And I'm very happy to see the x-rays. The trouble is in between patients when I go and get the root therapy done, and I think I think maybe you can tell that they're not that good. So also there's, there's been no you know crown coverage. So I wouldn't for a crown with the root therapies like that that would come and be coming to you for assessment. But that's a problem we have because they thought they can go, you know, get done elsewhere because it's less costly, etc. Uh, and you know, the, naturally, the cost is going to be you will end up probably losing those two teeth, and compared to you know having implant placement, I mean that's a problem we face unfortunately. Uh, and uh, you know, it's been absent for the last two years. I'll be giving a call. Oh, I'm really busy. Can't make it now. So we wait for another catastrophe to happen because he's not adhering to maintenance protocol. You write him letters saying, well, you're on your own. You just try your best to help him, but this will be hard. And it is important that patients will understand that somewhere down the line, things will fail if you don't maintain. He has a crucial split, and, and we ask, are you wearing a crucial split? He says, oh, not really, I forgot. But having said that, having said that, that's the occlusion prescription I have for this patient because it allows me, allows me, it's a non-precious, it's cast, it allows me to be able to improve the the uh, the longevity of the restoration. Okay, uh, uh, let's have a look at the low one, and uh, you can see that excursive movements are all basically around the implants. That gives me more support, reduce the stress system on the implants. It allows me to redistribute forces of uh, occlusion. And that's important. In generally, whenever you're doing any reconstructive work and you have implants or uh, two supported uh, superstructure, understand that, consider anterior clearance. In other words, anterior uh, guidance and posterior disclusion. Make it as shallow as you can to reduce the momentum on, the, on those teeth, supporting teeth or the implants. That makes life easier. That's important is reduce forces on supporting system because this is what caused the problem in the first place. So I think we're slowly coming to our favorite topic, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I know the evidence is anecdotal, but I find that zirconia crowns require, sorry about my spelling mistake, um, uh, you know, uh, considerable preparation for ideal property there. And uh, the problem is that it, the system has no gear. So that's your fractures, okay? Um, and um, and the problem is that we know that non will have teeth have compromised structural integrity, and uh, and not only that, but uh, they have um, uh, um, they have um, core integrity that's compromised, as well as most other important thing is that they have a castle flexion, which is very vulnerable uh, with compromised mechanical reception. That means they will more likely to have more load. In other words, the, the load threshold is very high and for the tooth to take it, so there's more chance of, of it fracturing, okay? I know the uh, evidence is anecdotal, but uh, uh, what I find is most of the teeth that I see with the cornea crowns and root therapy teeth are the highest in the patients presenting with root fractures. And what would your, your, be your opinion? Uh, yeah, so so with zirconia, I think I had a slide there um, a little bit further forward. Um, the first thing is the lab or the technician who designs the zirconia crowns, and we're talking here monolithic zirconia. If it was porcelain fused to zirconia, that's a good thing because the porcelain chips. So often the dentist doesn't remove enough structure. So there's not enough tooth structure removed and the technician needs room to build with the zirconia material, um, the cusps. So many teeth that I have seen in patients that had multiple crowns, um, what I'm finding is common when I ask them, do you know which is the zirconia crown? They're like, yeah, it gets in my way of the cheek and the tongue. So buccolingually, obviously it's a lot wider and it is over contoured. And it's because of this over contoured hard rock um, and you can't chip it, it doesn't wear type material that's over these substrates, which is the root, which often is um, the weak root, which has had endodontic therapy that eventually results in, in fracture. And I call it the bamboo stick type 
uh, analogy where you've got basically a very hard object on one side and you've got the bone on the other. In the middle, the substrate's the root and you're doing this type of forces when, you, when you're chewing and the middle will fracture and you'll end up with a, oblique fractures. So if you do design zirconia, combine it with porcelain, um, and if you have zirconia, definitely have it as a flat occlusal plane and reduce enough of the tooth. So um, I am, you know, recommending non-zirconia based materials. I understand that everyone's going zirconia for whatever reason, uh, um, but it's not good in the Bruxa guys when nothing happens, all the other teeth wear and zirconia stays the same from day one to day X. It is better for porcelain to chip. It is better for gold to wear. And these crowns adjust according to the bite. So um, I really want you guys to be very cautious when you're in a Bruxa place, either a non-precious hard alloy or zirconia. And of course, over any root treated tooth, you should really go for a fatty or plane, even if it's going to be zirconia because you love zirconia. And you can't, you know, change your mind about. We, we can't get you to change your mind about zirconia. And please reduce more, prepare them, reduce more tooth, because then you actually leave your um, technician more room. Because even if they are wide buckle ingly, they are problematic in various excursive movements. Interesting. Yeah. So you'll see some examples. I don't know if that's next in the slides, but sure. well, what I answer to you is that not everything is about milling, is it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, is it? Look, uh, no. you show the cast restorations or middle stomach restorations earlier with a wood fracture that over 25 years. So uh, we know, we know, and uh, my tell you know, I use a lot of these copper bladed dyes, and, and, and we know that the, the, the high gold noble alloy, not actually, I have to go to not a, not a non precious one. Because non pressure is very hard to bond force as much as a chip. It's quite hard, but you got high gold alloy. This crown is about two and a half pounds the expense of a normal zirconium milling crown, but they're the best of the two. You know, you've got to understand that patient pain by with therapy. And you can see that lower them, especially. That's beautiful. Yeah. Now you've got three mil long knife margins. Okay. Now I can feel every zirconium margin. I don't care who does, including myself. But I cannot feel the long sleeve gold margins. We teach at the college, you know, how to do this. It's a really clever way to do it. My mentor, I mean, has taught me this, and I'm grateful to Terry Walters, who's magnificent in this area. You can see how we go down and grab these roots, okay? And, you know, the way, the way it needs to be done, uh, the way we grab this root, and, and the system has gear, okay? It allows me to, when your cement is using phosphate, the cement probably a lot of know what zinc phosphate is, I guess. But when you use less of cement, okay, because subgingerly, you can flick the zinc phosphate cement. It has a give, and it's the most important thing that I feel from me as a clinician that gives me that warm, positive feeling when I'm now restoring this teeth. Because you can see the surface of the occlusion is flat. Okay, with chances. Your question, okay, it's flat occlusion, okay, it's not okay. sharp, curvy. My instructions to my technicians, flat occlusion. It's actually in my laboratory, it's already done. Like flat occlusion is there. I don't have to think about it. It's done, okay. I don't want cuss, not interested in cuss, okay. Nobody looks back in the mouth and says, How come it's flat? It doesn't work. You know, the old, uh, um, old concept of, for, you know, PK Thomas's occlusion, it's absolutely normal. I was good then. You know, great technician, great, uh, sorry, clinician, but it doesn't stand test of time. You're actually making it worse. Okay, brushes can't have, you know, castle type of inclines where they keep loading and you just smash it. You know, a lot of brushes have a large immediate size shift. They get this one. Okay, so they're going to smash everything that comes along the way. So understand why we, I have gone back now almost last, uh, more than uh, so many years. That uh, we use a metal ceramic, I reduce the cornea and possibly fit at all. I prefer Emax uh, on anterior restorations if it's equal gingival, supra gingival, and if it's anything sub gingival, it's always metal ceramic. The question that the colleagues must understand when you have one and a half, two million margins sub gingivally, it brings the cornea, 
how do you remove the cement? Okay, if you can answer that question, please go ahead and do the comment. Okay, think about that. Okay, now here's the patient we talked about when we're coming to your to your, to your in a minute. Here's a zirconia crown, one seven. Okay, and uh, this is the X-rays uh, that you're going to talk about doesn't belong to this patient. But would you please go ahead and and uh, explain what? Yeah. You yeah, so a couple of cases performed by endodontists. Um, uh, the top left is uh, endodontist in the States who did the retreatment of the upper seven, treated the upper six. And you can see the difference. It's a zirconia crown. It's, it's the first to bite on any, any occlusion. Don't worry about lateral excursive. <laughs> it's like a piston plunger cusp type thing up against actually that lower six, which also has an over-contoured zirconia. So what's happened is that it developed a deep pocket and there was a, uh, there was a chimney type defect um, when I had a look at it through... Um, Maybe while you're there, while you're yes. there uh, uh, I, I might bring Harry here on the question. Harry, can you hear me? Hang on. Can you hear me, Harry? Yeah? Yeah, I don't think he's there. Hang on, I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to mute him. Wait. Uh, hang on. I'll try to mute. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, can you hear me, Harry? You should. Can you hear me, Harry? I should be hearing it. Okay, I'm trying. I, I have I'm asking on mute. I did. Anyway, see what happens. Okay, I'll keep going on. Uh, yeah, and the lower the lower six is similar. Like um, from the time that crown was put on, the patient knew it's high. Eighteen months later, vertical root fracture, J shab lesion, distal root deep pocket, all because of an over contoured zirconia hard crown. Um, again, again, it's all about preparation of the tooth and giving the this technician issue. enough room. This issue, they do this digitally, right? They got a billing machine. Okay. Harris Markman doesn't work, unfortunately. The milling machine is made to sit on this one and, and mill it. The trouble is, trouble is, and Harry will say to you that he doesn't get good impressions. Okay? They don't get good records. Okay? Yeah. They have to try to guess the margins. Okay? Occlusion is absolutely, uh, they kind of put the occlusion together. So they guess everything. Okay? The dentist that gets a crown, he wants to just put the crown, some and see you later. You know, the adjustment takes time, okay? You know, yeah. and, and, and you need to stand the patient up and adjust it while they're in an eating position, not in a you know, sleeping position. That's all this are very important part of it, okay? So the average of they just put the crown in, that's it. Now, since some of the worst German crowns back in 1930s, patients still alive, they made a mark, but they actually knew how to put that crown in line. It was gold crown, so it adjusted. It actually was slightly malleable. It wore into occlusion. It was fine. But That's if right. all the new stomach crowns that are coming in, they don't have a gig. The problem is, even if it's okay for the first couple of years, once it goes to four years, the occlusion changes, but the ceramic doesn't change. It doesn't wear. Yeah. So at least at least the ceramic would chip <laughs> and then you'd be like okay if too many of them chip you'll figure out what's going on with the bite Metal. but the zirconia remains the same i mean it just doesn't change at all over time and the rest of the teeth the ceramic if the occlusion if the occlusion um, porcelain does chip or wear you can just polish you have a metal surface exactly and that maintains the crown system for a long time and this is so crucial okay the zirconia hasn't got it Okay, you know, it astounds me. Here's another one. Yeah. Here's the case you're seeing soon. I just want you to tell a patient, sorry, you're going to take the tooth, right? Yeah, obviously, because this is, um, on, this is a J-shaped lesion. You don't need a CBCT for it. It's a definite vertical root fracture. These are over-contoured zirconia crowns. And the other thing about the mesial root of upper molars is that it's a, a figure of eight shape. Whenever you find an MB2, you get happy. But in the process, you've drilled and you've actually increased the stress concentration that goes in the middle of the figure of eight. So a lot of the fractures are upper M MB roots. And guess what? If you're not conservative finding an AMB2, it is, it, after that, they crack. It takes two to three years before they crack. 
most of the failures I've seen of mine are 18 months to three years. And the same goes with all the other endodontists. So you've got to be so careful with these mesial root of upper molars when you manage them because they're not favorable anatomy from day one. And then, of course, when you put something as hard as that, like a rock on top, of course, it's going to fail. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time, I agree. Yeah. It is a risk factor, that patient be warned. You know, let's look at this patient on the pleasure point of view. I mean, I, I, I like this. I mean, uh, you know, I've taken my time taking his photos and, you know, I'm a photographer freak. I like, I like having good vision. I'm a very visual person. We teach this how to be visual. Then you see at the vision, you can see that this is an implant. He fractured that tooth. He lost that tooth. His implants placed here, and we got just fine contact, fine contact, and we can see, you know, and then we have a chord change inclusion, and uh, you know, and one seven is low. You can see the swelling buckle that's draining signs, and uh, obviously here I have a sign of fracture, and uh, we tend to think, well, you know, let's go back in time. I, I need, I like, I like being sort of detective. I like to see why it happened so I can learn from problems, from failures, okay? And over the period of time, you can see we're going to, he's got very nice teeth, he's a severe clencher. You can see the fracture of the left and side of here, okay? He's not a bruxa, he's a clencher. And it's worse, because they can lock in. And what happens is, uh, you know, it doesn't clench, so the A66, very healthy, going to the right, okay? Answer dynamic occlusion, going to the right, it's clearing, so, you know, what's your complaint? It's clearing, going more, it's clearing, and most of the dentists will say, well, that's fine. See you later. But wait, just wait. You gotta think a bit further, okay? You go in here and there's locks right in, okay? So locks right in and what happens? This cast bottom one was replaced by, the crown was placed, you know, can't remember when it was, and that, that patient patches the locks in and it actually fractures buckley, you know? And that's where the fracture line is for this patient. And uh, let's just look at it, how, it, how it seems to occur. I ask the patient to move and lock sick. And see how it's locking in? Okay. So don't just have a little movement. You go for the full range of the movement. Okay. People will go in and lock in that place. And that's what he likes to do. And this is a classic example how this occurs. Well, maybe, you know, remember when I want to And uh, uh, now, let's go to the next one. So here's an interesting patient. Okay. Patient presents the practice with his implant some time ago and uh, comes back. Well, there's a fail of the tooth support bridge work. I mean, we have to be very aware when you have a root therapy tooth supporting a lower long span bridge work. The patient especially with a bruxa in the clench. You can see the wear on the molars here, okay? Lots of restorations here. So his purpose is pressing so hard that, you know, we carry on, we start losing his teeth, okay? And the history of tooth loss from fracture. This is a, uh, a fully contoured zirconia. That's a metal ceramic. Okay, an old metal ceramic that's lasted quite a long time. And so the aim was to place a free implant because the brass is not too. I like to share the load and uh, at this age was fine. You can see that implant is slightly less. There's a composite here and there's a, uh, for, so, and for some reason, uh, the zirconia was placed. See, I wasn't around then, but it was zirconia was placed. It, it goes back and forth to Russia. And it's not about crown based loading, okay, with time. So I think that he might go back here, we won't see him for a long time. We went back ahead and uh, we placed occlusional overlays because, because he was sensitive here. I don't want the crowns, so there's occlusional overlays here. Just a, a two millimeter uh, a prep vertically, either shared for a small shoulder, like 0.5 millimeter shoulder. You can see the only here that sits and it's flat, okay, it's flat allows me to place it over the tooth, okay? This was done over the period of, I think, one year. And uh, you can see small reduction, just the edge, crowns fitted. You can see that after a certain way, there's some perforation here, but it doesn't matter, okay? Over here, you can see the slight super contact or medial trisal interference. So that's gently pulled during the six monthly you know, uh, visits. So flat occlusion, okay? Okay, it's very important, okay? Clearance in all movements. It's in, you know, think about those things. It has to clear. You can't see it, put a articulated paper. G, HM4, where you press the patient bites and you feel it's biting. As they move, you hold the pressure and then let it clear. Go back and have a look at it. You can't see it, it's wet. Sandblast the tooth. 
You get better marking on that particular pepper. You know exactly where it is, and that's how you get the marking, okay? I'm not used to electronic devices. It tells me that it's having, I mean, that's all, you know, I like to feel things, and to me, that's very important. Uh, and uh, so it's important to understand that you couldn't do this with uh, um, ceramic type of situation. I mean, I would use Emax here, definitely be gold, okay? Definitely be gold. Um, now, coming back, coming back has been for seven years. And look what happened. I can see my OLED still in place, okay? Now, what happened was uh, we, have a, um, we have a metal ceramic bridge work here. Again, so all that's holding very well, maintained, there's no fracture, okay? Everything's fine. The problem is the zirconia's gone, okay? Zirconia crowns have <laughs> gone completely, okay? Yeah, I mean, this is such a great... It's an interesting one, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're gonna say, so yeah. Uh, any, 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 uh, any, I mean, any comments on that, maybe? So, so uh, was there actually um, like a fracture in the root as well in this case when you took these teeth out? Mm -hmm. Did you see any fractures? It's very interesting. I haven't seen one. Oh, he came uh, in that fracture was, there. On the teeth, he just came in. It's completely sheared. So yeah. this year. So it, it, what I'm simply saying is that when you have a whole system here that's functioning, okay, it overrides the cornea. So if the cornea crown didn't break, it's just a supporting system broke, which is the teeth. Okay, you know, you gotta be very wary. So oh, this is really strong. And what it really means really strong. Okay. I mean, which is most important, the tooth that maintains restorations, okay, or the longevity of the tooth that maintains maintains restoration. Or the longevity of restoration. I'll take on the tooth. Okay. Tooth. Definitely tooth. You've got to think like that. So, you know, you think about treatment sequence. Treatment sequence. You stabilize, control, reduce the risk factors, and reinforce maintenance program. And then we moving along, diagnostic phase. I like to test the system. I like to know which way this patient, this particular patient, not all the patients, this patient responding to the initial treatment and followed by definite treatment and natural maintenance protocol. So, you know, why do people know how to bend the rules? You know, Aristotle was inventing the bending of rule of the SDR measuring cylindrical volumes. We need to think about these things. We need to understand that we have to do individual risk assessment. Individual risk assessment is very important to improve the prognosis of your treatment and reduce, okay, and reduce further failure. Because that failure is 100% failure for that patient. And we have to understand that, okay? Every patient, individual, and they trust our judgment to make it right for them. It's important to do your diagnostics. You can't, you know, it's funny. I was in, I was in, um, you know, Eastern um, Block. Uh, I was lectured with quite a nice, nice, large number of dentists in the audience. And I was talking about diagnosis and triple planning. And the interesting part was, uh, you know, he got up and said, look, I've done this crown thousands of times, like 10,000, I've done 10,000 posts. You talk about diagnosis and triple planning. Now tell me about the problems. I said, <laughs> I said, you know, I said, I'm sorry to tell you, but you could have done this 10,000 times wrong. Did it ever occur to you? You know, all right, you want to do the same thing, you have a different result. That's a sign of insanity. You're going to change. <laughs> You're going to think, okay? It's important to understand and ask the right questions. So what happens is, patient comes in, don't you love this picture? You ever think how I took this photo? Amazing. Okay, interesting photo, isn't it? This is an interesting picture. So what I like to say is that you need to ask the question, why did this two fraction in the first place before you restore them? Why this way access? Okay, very important. This why is a very important question to ask because you need to think, would my restoration that I'm going to replace this tooth be subject to the same forces that cause failure of the tooth? This is interesting. This is a composite veneer that bonded to the tooth. And the tooth fractured sheared, and the whole composite veneer is still bonded to the part of the tooth. And people tell me the composite is not strong enough. I mean, you can do wonders with the composite, am I right, maybe? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They get the wonders. Of course, there's a fatigue. Yes, there is a fatigue. There's no caries here. It's fatigue there. 
She's been grinding in the front. You can see the wear on your bottom tip, okay? There's actually a lack of posterior support. So I ended up doing reconstruction of the posterior teeth to give a better support and give enough of the freeway space, not freeway space, enough of the long centric, as you call, so she can function without hitting those front teeth. Occlusion of trauma, parafunction, direct trauma, tooth going through the teeth, multifactorial, you know, think beyond what you risk. And naturally, you know, reason for a tooth fracture is your risk assessment. First thing I'll do, okay, before the fracture would happen, I go back in, I actually put the tool back in to protect the stars, okay, just to give you an example. You can sometimes walk back in time to get it right. And adjust it, adjust the supra contacts, okay, and reduce the cause of trauma. We need to think about this to prevent. So, coming back, to the webinar seven take home message. Uh, I hope it's an interesting one. Let's talk about this. Stabilize, control phase, reinforce, maintenance program. Complex problem, simplify them. Don't make it complicated, both biological and financial for the patient. Understand the risk factors at patient level, tooth level, restoration level. Time is on our side. So test, drive the system. We need to understand this thing. Okay, what is your condition to plan that things fail? You gotta think about that. Patient understands the risks. We are both together, but it's like, I'm on the outside of the tunnel, I'm trying to patient, I'm gonna help you to go through this tunnel. We are on the way to the patient, but you know, it's not light within the, uh, light at the end of the tunnel, it's actually light within. We have to understand that, okay? Understand that do not rush into definite treatment. There's too much rush amongst colleagues to do the job. Okay, gotta sit back and think about the case. Now, Harry will know, my technician, that I sit back, call him my wife, let's call Alex. I said, need you guys on board, I gotta talk about this case. So I have my treatment plan, I'll say, what if we use? I give my opinion, so if you do this, my head. So there's a discussion on board, it's very important. Okay, get a specialist on board, this helps. I mean, I asked you maybe, okay, I, asked, yeah. I I want prognosis. And, and maybe uh, I mentioned this whole do, don't rush into definitive treatment a little bit on my side. When I see a case that has a vertical fracture, or not, let's not call it a fracture, just a crack, crack line or a crazed line, mm -hmm. and you're not sure and you brace the tooth and you start endodontic therapy, what do I do with these unpredictable, uncertain cases, which I admit to from the start to the patient, but the patient says, look, you know, I still value my natural tooth. I know it's unpredictable. I want to still try to save it for as long as I can. Apart from obtaining consent, I slow the process of to completion. So what I do is obviously think about the occlusal splint, think about adjustment of the bite, think about the missing spaces, think about the patient's apnea and all that, you know, um, other pot potential reasons. Then I medicate the root canal system. I place calcium hydroxide with a long-term you know, um, uh, provisional, which lasts, which is often a band with a cavity GIC um, double seal. And I watch the case over six months. I don't ask the patient to have a crown straight away. I ask the patient after that six months, if there's no deep pocket, if there's no symptoms, I complete the treatment. And then I ask someone like Sarkis to place a provisional core or restoration. And we wait another six months. And that's a year we've bought to see this case fail. And if it doesn't fail, that's when you can move on to more um, definitive um, restorative work. You, while you're there, do the core there. Once you seal the system, I'll Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and, and, and a long-term cuspal overlay composite on some molars and premolars is not a bad option. Like leave it if it's cracked, you know, with that for two years before you decide to crown the tooth like that. Um, so there's other options to, you know, going for a definitive expensive uh, treatment straight away. On board. Okay. What's an ideal treatment plan? Not for the dentist, but for the patient. That's really important. That's true. You know, I mean, everyone thinks that they can do this and that and that. And that's what the patient doesn't want that. So you have to explain to the patient, I can take you as far as you want to go, but I need to know where you want me to go. And they didn't understand that. Okay. And what is the best consent for the patient? Okay. This is very important. Okay. And after all, after all, we have to think about. See, when you think about 
cracked teeth or stressed teeth, the biologically damaged teeth, they got a 20% chance of being root therapy. After root therapy, that 20% got 40, 40 or 50, about 50% chance of actually losing the tooth. When you think about that, of that 20%. So if it's possible, we should do whatever we can to maintain the tooth structure, of course. So above all, maintaining biology is the most important part of any treatment planning. And this is why people say, well, cyclists like composites. I do like porcelain. I can do some non-invasive porcelain treatments that is as good as cutting teeth. The trouble is sometimes I like to use composites to test the system like for that patient, okay? You load the system, you might have a problem. And you, know, you cannot control the other side of things. So doing simple treatment that's affordable for the patient and they're happier to get confidence on board and they know where they are and they come back like a lot of my porcelain work now is on on the you know uh, 60,000 composite measures I've done. I'm just replacing them now. I give an option, I can do another composite, I get another porcelain. But we did test the system. We knew where these people are. And we're happy to replace more durable restorations now. And I think that is good dentistry. Uh, I hope you're all happy. I hope you all enjoy the lecture. Now, if there's any questions, have you written me any questions? I'm trying to find these questions. Are, are the questions? If anyone wrote questions, I'm happy to answer them. We might have two CPD points. Uh, I hope Natasha's hearing. Might have to, <laughs> it should be two, uh, if we can extend it with a few yeah, questions. Yeah, please. I'll be able to two CPD points. I've got a message from Natasha. I'm just having a look. Okay. Uh, Harry's other work, send link. Okay. Uh, she's sending link now. Uh, the link is um, sent to your email, Dr. Sarkis. So if you just put that on the Zoom chat um, so that everyone can have that link. Can you tell me where's the Zoom chat? I can't find it. I'm sorry about this. Just, usually if That's you... okay. So you know how you share your screen on the right-hand side corner, yeah, there yeah. is a Zoom chat. On the right side? Hang on. Yeah. Where's the share your screen on the right side corner? Hang on. Sorry about this. There's a share screen. New share or... Share screen, okay. No, not on the new share. On the same um, tab there, uh, you'll see participant, video, mute. On yes. the right-hand side, you'll see chat. More, we said, hang on. I'm just having a look, I'm sorry about this. Uh, participants, hang on, participants. Okay, one second. Okay. Just one second. Uh, can you just go me into a... That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll just log in. Yes, yeah, so you and I'll just send the link to everyone if that's okay. Sure. Is there any questions, guys? Or the, if you write the question, I'll pick up their lines to the photo. Sorry. Um, yes. Anyone can just unmute themselves and they should be able to ask okay. any questions if anyone has any questions. Any questions? Nimesh Patel has raised his hand. Okay, go ahead, Nimesh. No, it might be just by mistake, Sarkis. I'm all good. I'm all good. I've got a question, Sarkis. Go ahead. Is it? Uh, so, so I had a, a patient recently where we had a, a second molar. We had a third molar present, but the second molar had a, a distal, a distal occlusal. Lower molar. A lower molar. So she's four seven. Uh -huh. Uh, this distal occlusal crack. Uh, there was there was occlusal where you could see a flat uh, occlusal plane in that distal area, and that crack really only extended about two, maybe three millimeters from the distal over the occlusal. Mm -hmm. The rest of that tooth was was untreated, so so virgin tooth. Mm -hmm. And I sort of sat there pondering, you know, there's a crack, yes, but it's a virgin tooth do I really want to cut this tooth to bits with a crown? Um, do I want to put maybe some occlusal coverage 
maybe just on the distal portion. Um, looking at your lecture, I saw that you put that um, that sort of occlusal flat plane um, crown on that previous patient. Maybe that's a good idea. But I was just wondering, what, what are your thoughts when it's such a small crack, but you don't want to be too destructive? Is it symptomatic? No. It's not symptomatic. Many of you say. But, 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 but sorry, it's a crack that's very obvious. You can put your probe in this crack. Okay, well, that's a problem then. Yeah. Is it, is it, is it, it should be if you can probe your probe the crack. It, you, have you done a vitality testing, a sensibility testing? You know, frack yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so tooth is vital. Uh, I mean, I think it's early Is it, is it, it. Is it I, lingering? Is it lingering to eyes? Uh, no, I, I think I think I think it's early days, and I think that the depth of that vertical crack is probably only one, maybe one and a half millimeters. I don't think it's even into dentine. Yeah, but it's yeah. just what, where do I go from a preventative oh, point here? Yeah, I mean, look, we recommend banding these teeth. Um, it does commit the tooth to some sort of an overlay restoration eventually. Um, but of course, you know, another option is to put a composite overlay. Um, but normally these overlays do remove the uh, mesial, uh, you know, you don't preserve the mesial ridge. You actually reduce it by 0.5 to a mil and you overlay the entire uh, mesial region as well and you keep everything flat. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's either that or a band whichever you think is less destructive on your hands. Um, so normally it's a band, according to what we usually discuss, you know, what, amongst uh, other endodontists and colleagues. And, and then your, lo your long-term, sorry, is... Long-term, long -term, you obviously uh, test, vitality test, if there's a still vital normal, then you probably would put a composite overlay, um, a flat occlusal plane. And then after that, you know, if it's all fine, you just keep a watch on it. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend um, at, the, at that point any crown unless, you know, you keep watching it and it becomes symptomatic. Then obviously, you know, you've got to get in and see where the crack is going. Often, often maybe distally it's going more towards the gingival margin. Then you've got to wrap it around with a gold and flat occlusal plane gold crown. Um, but going back to the lower seven, remember what I said? Lower sevens are the worst teeth. <laughs> so, so, um, mate, I've seen, you know, I've done, I've done enough to see my own failures. Mm. Upper premolars and lower sevens are the worst teeth. And if I had to say which one out of the two, I'd say the lower sevens because oh. some of those upper premolars you extract anyway. There's, you know, no buckle cusp, there's not much, or the palatal cusp is fractured and, you know, there's not much tooth left. But those lower sevens that I have treated, which were vertically cracked, it's just a downhill, it's just, it just goes downhill. Easy question for you. What's the rest of the mouth is like and how old is the patient? Uh, so patient's mid thirties right. and the rest of the mouth is actually very unrestored, but uh, the majority of the, the lower molar cusps and upper molar cusps show occlusal wear from bruxism. So it's got occlusal wear from bruxism. Are there steep cusps or, show, or flat cusps? Flat cusps, completely flat down. Not not everywhere, but but you, you, you 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 is that root function or is there a bit of the left or what is it? It's just group now. We're, we're wearing those seven group pictures. It's a group function. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look, uh, if this isymptomatic, okay, I would just do initial profit like I'll reduce the cusp, okay, on that area. Okay. All right, but I explain to him to take it easier too. But I'll Knowing the guys of Brock said he's worn his tip out, and knowing that that particular tip in the future will have some sort of treatment, I'll prophylactically uh, uh, go ahead and do a little metal overlay. You don't go past the contact point, just on top of the contact point, and it's flat. So uh, you can explain that to him, that that needs to be done. Uh, you can even do it with a, in that particular case, is, uh, uh, I mean, maybe the same like composite. It just doesn't do much for you there, maybe. That's what I'm saying. Uh, you can do it's more. It's more just um, really just uh, the overlay means less flexural forces. Um, and I guess I understand what you mean because where the depends on where the crack line is really. Um, I I still would you know I'll I'll keep it conservative. So if you think the metal overlay that you suggest is gonna like it's gonna be gold. Great, gold is also excellent. Um, I mean, I could, I'd rather use Emacs. It's just, it's just a bit more expensive, but yeah, okay. If if you guys think that um, Emacs is not, like composite seems to be the least expensive um, option, 
Is it between EMS and, and the and the type three gold or high gold uh, normal alloy overlay? Gold is better always. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're gonna do uh, EMS overlay, that will work. But EMS, you're gonna if you have a hard enamel, you see, if you have the, it depends when you're boning EMAX. This is the problem. You're doing a tabletop, right? You can do even tabletop, right? But you have to reduce. Another way of doing it is the reason I like gold is or composite in your case is uh, is some of you do a localized dull effect where you build a surface on that, okay? And they fire on that and the tube just intrudes, and you got room to build. The trouble is you can actually crack the tube. The propagate can go. So there's no hard and short answer. In my opinion, I look at it, and, and if you have a digital camera, scan it, I monitor the way, monitor the crack, if it's going up, go for a duty metal overlay, don't even think of that. Yeah, um, whatever you do, just on excursive movements, Izzy, you just gotta make sure that it's not touching. Mm -hmm. So you just gotta adjust it really well and get rid of any plunger cusp. I find that the plunger cusp upper seven going into the lower seven, is, is gu the guilty cusp. So get rid of that cusp, adjust that cusp um, before you do anything else and then get lateral excursion happening and make sure it doesn't touch at all. Whatever you do, like that's the least you should be doing. Mm -hmm. Selective occlusal adjustment and get rid of that upper plunger cusp, that palatal cusp, you know. Thank you, thank you very much. No worries. Any other questions? Thank you, Sarkis. My pleasure, thank you. Well, I think, uh, uh, Kevin, have you um, got any questions at all? Uh, Zoom chat has been disabled for some reason. So on the website, uh, in, in around 15 minutes, there should be a link uh, on the webinar page. Mm -hmm. So everyone can just click on the link and fill up the form. Okay, fine, all right. So okay. that, was, that was my fault, right? <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't my fault. <laughs> no, that wasn't your fault. It's Zoom's fault, actually. Yeah, I think I think it was good. We had a good chat. So, um, well, thank you, Sarkis. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, thank you, Manny, for joining. Cheers, guys. Thanks for the questions, okay. Izzy. Good questions, always. You guys all say this too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Cheers, cheers. Thank cheers. You. Kevin, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Harry, thank welcome. you, doctor. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye, Thanks. guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, my pleasure, thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed themselves here.